indeed. So last Sunday in May 2021, and we are at the book of Obadiah. I'm not even going to bother asking how many of you have uh, actually studied Obadiah before. <laughs> I hadn't. I know I read it, but again, it hadn't really registered with me. But um, again, we'll start with a bit of background, and this will be especially brief because Obadiah, popular name in the Bible, pops up many, many times. Here, we have no details. It just says the vision of Obadiah, right? Doesn't give his father's name, his hometown, any other details. But we do know one other thing about him, and that is that he lived through that horrific time for the people of Judah when Babylon conquered and dragged them away into exile. Who is he addressing his letter to? It's not, yeah, I mean, it. It is almost entirely directed to a nation called Edom, E-D-O-M, Edom. So why preserve this letter? Not even toward the people of Israel. Well, in a way, all of these letters are intended for God's people because Edom had done some really bad things to Judah. So let's look at the outline of it. It's very easy to break down. It's only 21 verses long. The first verse is just the vision of Obadiah, right? Period. Introduction done. And then says, thus says the Lord concerning Edom. So, we launch immediately into a portion that talks about the judgment that is promised to this nation of Edom. And that will be through the, through nine, the first nine verses. And it says things like, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You see, Edom was located in a very mountainous area. They lived at pretty high elevations. And this was to them an idea of safety, that no one could reach them where they were. But God said, you know, you say, who will bring me down to the ground? And God says, well, I will. Thanks for asking. And the punishment assigned to them is not just that they will be brought down from the heights of their pride, but that they will be absolutely ransacked, that everything they have will be taken or destroyed. And even their allies will deceive them, will drive them out, will set traps for them. And all of the wisdom of Edom, which apparently Edom was fairly well known for producing uh, wise men, <laughs> And this is, your wise men will be destroyed from out among you, and your understanding will be taken away. And even your mighty men will be dismayed. Now, why? Why is this severe judgment declared on this neighboring nation of Edom? Well, here's the thing. You might notice 
in verse eight. He starts referring to them as Mount Esau. Now Esau should be a familiar name to you, right? Abraham had his promised son, Isaac. Isaac had two sons, twins, the elder, Esau, the younger, Jacob. And it's important to remember that relationship as you're reading through Obadiah because it says, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. Now you remember back in Genesis, the relationship between the brothers Esau and Jacob was never a peaceful one. Uh, they were extremely different in temperament and in preferences and they were favored by different parents. Esau was Isaac's favorite, Jacob was Rebekah's favorite. And they were always in conflict to the point where Esau actually starts to comfort himself by saying, my father can't live that much longer when the days of mourning for him are over. <laughs> I'm going to kill my brother. And the relationship between the brothers became the relationship between the nations that were descended from the brothers. And in the day when Babylon came and knocked down the gates of Jerusalem and dragged the people away, apparently the nation of Edom was close at hand. It says on the day you stood, uh, on the day that you stood aloof, when the strangers carried off your brother Jacob's wealth, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. But do not gloat over the day of your brother and the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of their distress. And it gets worse because it says, you know, that they, they looted Jerusalem in the wake of Babylon's looting. And they waited at the nearby crossroads to catch fugitives from the siege, to capture them and sell them into slavery. This is the crime for which Edom is being punished. That's verses 10 through 14. And it would be understandable if we were left with, this is the judgment, this is the reason for judgment, and that's it. But the last verses, 15 through 21, bring back to us the concept of the day of the Lord. It says the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. And there's one exception to all of this. Starting in verse 17, it says, In Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. In the day of judgment, when the day, the day when the Lord visits the nations with basically justice for their own actions, there will be a remnant of the house of Jacob. Again, we're back to Jacob and Esau. And verse 18 makes it very clear. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. The house of Esau will be like stubble. Now, I don't know how many of you have lived in a farming community, but you know that a field recently harvested and left to dry catches fire very easily. And the promise at the end is there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau. 
for the Lord has spoken. It says the possessions of Esau, along with the possessions of all the other nations, will belong to the kingdom of the Lord. And he says the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And that's how the book ends. With the day of the Lord and the restoration of his people. Now that's the part that suggests that this was not just written for Edom, but for the people of Judah, who at this time are living a very different existence than what is promised here. So, I mean, short book, the themes are not new. Edom apparently has more judgment prophecies against it than any other of the surrounding nations. And I think really all of this comes back to that relationship that the history of two nations was originally the history of two brothers. If you think about it, Esau, son of Isaac, grandson of Abraham, he should have known growing up of the promise to Abraham of the working of God on behalf of his grandfather and his father. And yet you, you see the kingdom of Edom that has descended from him does not know the Lord. They do not worship the God of Abraham. In fact, they are relentlessly hostile against the people of God. And the promise, right? The promise that God made to Abraham in the very beginning, Genesis 12, along with, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. He also says, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. This is the, the bitter half of that promise, that those who have cursed the people of God will themselves be under a curse. And there are, there are parallels, not, not exact parallels, in other of the books, like Jeremiah. Have you look at Jeremiah chapter 49. Starting in verse 7, where uh, Jeremiah would have been a contemporary of Obadiah. They both lived through the Babylonian um, invasion and conquest. And there is very similar language used in Jeremiah particularly um, <clears throat> verses nine and 10, if grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? If thieves came by night, would they not destroy only enough for themselves? And that's exactly what he says, um, Obadiah in verses five, basically five and six. It's like, if, if people who came and just wanted to steal your stuff, they would leave something, but I will leave nothing. And he, in Jeremiah, it actually says, if those who did not deserve to drink the cup must drink it, will you go unpunished? Because when Babylon came, uh, they swept away the righteous along with the wicked. There were people, not many, I will grant you, but there were people in Judah who did not deserve this, if you want to put it that way. But they were caught up in it, preserved, of course, by the grace of God. But 
is an interesting point. If even those who did not deserve to suffer this had to suffer this, what about you, Edom? And of course, Jeremiah, if you read that, <laughs> he goes into even more detail on the judgment and this describes Edom as becoming a horror, like Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> it's like burned and salted the ground. Nothing will ever live here again. And then if you look at Psalm 137, A psalm of lament. And of course, it's all about the captives in Babylon. But in the midst of this, talking about um, living in exile, grieving their homeland, and being mocked by their captors, in the middle of this, verse 7, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites. The day of Jerusalem, how they said, lay it bare, lay it bare down to its foundations. So even though they are you know, oppressed by Babylon, grieving that, they still remember that bitter betrayal of a, a nation that should have been as a brother to Israel. basically saying, <laughs> hey, Babylon, while you're doing that, be thorough. Make sure nobody escapes. Take it all down to the ground. I, I just find it interesting that in the midst of their bitterness against Babylon, Edom merits a verse. <laughs> But there is more than just bitterness and judgment here in Obadiah. It's the shortest of the 12 minor prophets, and yet it still fits in that call of hope. That in the midst of bitterness, there is still that promise. that the Lord is sovereign even over the enemies of his people. That the day of the Lord will always catch up with the wicked. And that the righteous are in his hands. That they will not be forgotten. They will never be forsaken. And in the end, when the Lord has put all his feet, uh, enemies under his feet, well, future prophecy still, that his people will live in his kingdom free, abundantly provided for, without fear of their enemies. I think that's a lot to fit in a short little book like Obadiah. But I hope this will uh, at least make this book of more interest to you when you happen to be passing by it again. That you will remember the two brothers and the God who is sovereign over both. So that's Obadiah.